All right, so how many steps in the glycolytic pathway? Ten. And what is the end product of the glycolytic pathway? Pyruvate. And where does pyruvate go if we have oxygen to help? And how does it get to the Krebs cycle? Nope, it doesn't go through the electron transport train. How, chain, how do we get pyruvate from, well, first of all, where does the glycolytic pathway happen? Cytosol or in the mitochondria? In the cytosol. So pyruvate is being produced where? In the cytosol. So how do we move pyruvate from the cytosol to the Krebs cycle? Where is the Krebs cycle taking place? In what part of the mitochondria? The matrix of the mitochondria. So we have to take pyruvate and we have to get it into the matrix. You know, remember that step? No? Pyruvate interacts with a transport protein. That transport protein moves the pyruvate from the cytosol into the matrix. And as it's doing that, we strip off carbon dioxide and we strip off an electron to form NADH. And we add on that sulfur containing coenzyme A to form acetyl-CoA. Remember? Now, acetyl-CoA, we're going to get two pyruvates, two acetyl-CoA from each individual molecule of glucose, right? That acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle. How many steps in the Krebs cycle? Eight, eight, eight reactions in the Krebs cycle. And what are we doing in the Krebs cycle? What's the big thing that's happening in the Krebs cycle? Excuse me. Everybody's going to come in with a bunch of food. They just kind of like, yeah, I want to sell it. This is turned out pretty much in all the salt and all these salt beets. They just eat constantly. <laughs> So citric acid cycle it turns. It turns two times. And what, what's the main product that we're producing out of there? NADHs. And then where do those go? And why are they going to the electron transport chain? What are they actually shuttle? The electrons. They're moving electrons to the electron transport chain. And we're going to flow the electron through the electron transport chain into the blood. Oxygen and also some protons, hydrogen H plus to form water. So we have oxygen that's available and it pulls electrons through the electron transport chain to itself. Why? Why, do, why does the electron go through the electron transport chain to oxygen? Electronegativity. Increasing electronegativity to oxygen. Now, as that's happening, what's What's being accomplished at each step along the electron transport chain, especially complex one, three, and four? Electrons move through those complexes. What happens with hydrogens? The protons get pumped into the inner membranous space. Get pumped from the matrix into the intermembrane space. That creates a hydrogen concentration gradient that we call the proton motive force. Then ATP synthase makes the intermembrane permeable to hydrogen. The hydrogen passes through our ATP synthase, which acts like a mill. And as the hydrogen spins, the um, cylinder rotates the rotor rod, causes deformation of the catalytic knob and we generate ATPs, okay? We also had this thing called substrate level phosphorylation. And what was that? Anybody remember substrate level phosphorylation? It was phosphorylation at the level of the substrate. What are the substrates? They are the products that are being produced each step of the glycolytic pathway in the Krebs cycle. Each of those reactions are substrates that are being produced. 
and we're phosphorylating something, which means we are which means we are taking ADP and PI and we're putting them together. We're phosphorylating ADP to form ATP. Okay? Is everybody sort of keeping up a little bit here? So ultimately, there's a bunch of things that are happening. We have ATPs that are being used and ATPs that are being produced. We have NADHs and FADHs that are being generated. We have other molecules that are being taken off or put on. And we end up with a bunch of molecules from single molecule glucose that end up generating ATP directly to phosphor, uh, substrate level phosphorylation or those electrons, the carry the electron transport chain and through oxidative phosphorylation, we generate those ATP molecules. Would it be really helpful if we could account for all of the ATPs and NADHs and everything being produced and where they're actually being produced? Yes, it would be helpful. And so we actually want to account for for our ATP molecules. So in terms of cellular respiration, what's the first step in cellular respiration? What do we call it? Glycolysis. So from glycolysis, we're going to have those 10 individual reactions from glycolysis to pyruvate. So we have 10 different steps. Each step has an enzyme. These 10 steps are going to be divided up into two different phases. Steps 1 through 5 we call investment. Now we've already hit on this. Anyone happen to remember why we call it the investment phase? Take a look, if you're looking in your book, take a look at step number one and tell me what's happening there. I'll give you a little bit of it. We start with glucose and we convert it into glucose 6-phosphate. So we have a phosphate that's being added to the sixth carbon of glucose. We're going to need a phosphate source. Our phosphate source is going to be ATP. The enzyme is hexokinase. So hexokinase binds glucose and binds the ATP, catalyzes or breaks that ATP apart, takes the inorganic phosphate, pops it onto the sixth carbon of glucose to form glucose six phosphate. I've just burned an ATP. What am I really trying to do? I'm trying to generate ATP. So I just actually had to use an ATP molecule. We're going to invest that ATP molecule with the notion that eventually we're going to get a much larger payoff of ATP in the end. So steps one through five, you're going to see two different steps where ATPs are going to be catalyzed, are going to be used to be added to our substrates. So in terms of accounting, we're going to have two ATPs that are going to be used. And they're coming, or they're being used in step one and step three. So step one is to take glucose converted into glucose 6-phosphate. We're using an ATP to have that phosphate. Step two is an isomerization reaction. So we're going to take that glucose 6-phosphate and we're going to turn it into an isomer of glucose, which is fructose. And so we get fructose 6-phosphate. Then in step 3, there is an enzyme there called PFK1, phosphofructokinase 1. Phosphofructokinase 1 is another kinase. Kinases always add on phosphates to their substrate. So we're going to take that fructose 6-phosphate and add on another phosphate. We're putting it this time on the first carbon. So we end up with uh, uh, fructose 1,6-biphosphate or bisphosphate. Both are acceptable. So, like in the background, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
that is the step where the ATP is losing one of its phosphates that's been put onto the substrate, the glucose and then the, the glucose 6 phosphate. Okay? So I'm using two ATPs there. Everybody sort of following what I'm saying? So that first step, I use two ATPs. So if we're counting the number of ATPs that are going to be produced, through steps one through five, we're at a negative two. Right? If I go down to the stock market in New York City on Wall Street, and I got a hundred bucks in my pocket, and I say, let's put this on Parker and Gamble, I invest it. I no longer have the hundred bucks, but the idea is that that stock is going to generate investment income for me. And so even though I'm investing and losing the hundred dollars up front, later on I'm hoping I'm going to get a thousand dollars back out of that hundred dollar investment. Right? So the same notion applies here. I'm spending my ATP, putting that into the glycolytic pathway with the idea that once I get down to the electron transport chain later on, I'm going to be able to gain back a whole bunch more ATP. So kind of in your mind here, as you're sort of thinking through the accounting for ATP, I'm going to already start out after the first five steps, especially in steps one and three, and I'm going to have a net ATP I'm going to have a net ATP of minus two, right? Everybody see where I get the minus two from? I use two of my ATPs already. So I no longer have them. I've, I've paid them off. I've invested into the pack. So I go through the rest of um, four and five, steps four and five, and I get to step six through ten. Step six through ten we call the payoff. Now, Take a look at step number five. And what happens in step number five is we're actually taking our six carbon fructose and we're going to break it up into two three carbon molecules. So the rest of the glycolytic pathway from a single molecule of glucose entering in, we're actually going to be dealing with two separate three carbon molecules because we isomerize to form the uh, glyceraldehyde phosphate, and we're going to move that through. So this is going to be called the payoff 6 through 10. You're going to notice that we have some reactions there where I actually produce ATP. They occur in step 7 and in step 10. So I'm going to generate four ATP, and really it's two ATP per three carbon molecule. But alongside of those ATP molecules, I'm also going to generate two NADHs. This is happening in step number six, one NADH per three carbon molecule. We need to find a way to write down. Because all, some of you are just kind of taking notes, and that's not going to be very beneficial. I know it's not very clear here, but we'll, we'll try to use it. If you have your book or you have a laptop in front of you, it might not be a bad idea to bring up the glycolytic pathway so you can see it. So, steps one through five. Okay? One through five. I'm taking ATP in steps one and three and converting it into ADP. And you can see that from here to here, I've added the phosphate group right there on my glucose 6-phosphate. And then I isomerize. It's phosphoglucal isomerase. Fructose 6-phosphate is what's produced. And then through phosphofructokinase, I'm taking it on phosphorylated again. So I'm spending another ATP to generate that phosphate. That phosphate gets put onto the first carbon of that fructose 6-phosphate to generate fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now, steps 4 and 5 are pretty interesting. Step 4 
Center valve is an enzyme called aldolase. And it's going to generate two products. We're taking that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and we're breaking it into two, three carbon molecules. Those two, three carbon molecules are going to be the glyceraldehyde three phosphate, and then over here we're going to have the dihydro um, acetone phosphate. I can only use the, the, the glyceraldehyde three phosphate through the rest of these remaining six through ten reactions. So step number five is actually to take the end product here of step four, at least one of them, which is now a three carbon, and I'm going to use the triose phosphate to isomerize, so it's a triose phosphate isomer, isomerase, to glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Okay? So now from this point forward, you've got to think in terms of two reactions occurring for my individual molecule of glucose. Does everybody kind of see what's going on? Does everybody have a good source to, to look at? We've got a hydrogen. So 6 through 10 we call the payoff phase. And in 6 through 10 what we should see is 4 ATPs and 2 NADHs. Well here's an ATP and here's an ATP. So there's 2. How do I get the 4? That's not rhetorical. It's a question I want you to answer. I can show you where two of them are. Where do I get the other two? Because the, we actually have two of the glyceraldehyde three phosphates because of this isomerization here. So really think about this whole part being doubled and being shown down here at the bottom. Okay? So now that's my four ATPs. Then I also have here in number six, I have an NADH being or NAD plus being converted into NADH and a hydrogen. But I need two. So why is it two? Because again, we're going through the six through ten twice because of the breakdown of the six carbon into the three, two three carbon molecules. Is everybody following me? There are two different reactions that are occurring. Step number four. So we start out with fructose one six bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is going to interact with this enzyme called aldolase. Aldolase is going to create two products for my fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, how many carbons does it have? How many carbons? One, two, three, four, five, six. Eldolase rips that molecule apart. It breaks it into two three carbon molecules. You get dihydroacetone phosphate, and then you get glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Glyceraldehyde three phosphate is the only molecule that can continue through the glycolytic pathway through six, step six through ten. So step number five is actually going to occur to take that dihydro and convert it into di, the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Do you follow me? Yeah. Okay. So then from here, you've got to take two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. Go through the rest of the process. So any place I get an ATP, I actually get two ATPs from an individual molecule of glucose. Any place I get NADHs, I get two NADHs. Okay? So over here for our accounting, we start out with minus two. I've added four. So we're going to add in four. So my net is really going to be plus two ATP. So even already, I've made a little bit on my investment. I put two in, got four out, so now I have a net of plus two. Yeah. Okay, so I just have one question to clarify. So you said step four breaks apart the um, fructose five phosphate with aldolase. No, no, no fructose one six bisphosphate. Okay. Oh, sorry, I read that wrong. It was And then so it breaks it into the glyceraldehyde um, and dihydroxy. Yeah. So. 
you have glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which is what will continue through the rest of the glycolytic pathway. But you also produce this dihydroxyacetone phosphate. That cannot continue through. But it is an isomer of, glyce of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So if I can take that dihydroxyacetone phosphate and convert it into G3P? That's what step five is. That's what step five is. So notice the name of the enzyme there. Trios phosphate isomerase. It's trios because it's a three carbon sugar. Remember OSE means sugar, tri means three. So three carbon sugar that's already phosphorylated. There's my phosphate group. And that's an isomer. I'm going to change it to, I'm going to basically reorganize the geometry of the molecule. Same exact chemical formula, just reorganized to get my G3P. So now I have two G3Ps that are both simultaneously going to go through the rest of the path. So everything that happens from this point forward is going to double. Okay, so I got a, a net of plus two ATP at the end of glycolysis. I also could put in there that I have two pyruvates. So from one molecule of glucose, I've now generated two pyruvate molecules. So here's my pyruvate. I have two of them. Those two pyruvates are now going to be moved into the mitochondria. So we had pyruvate transport. How many pyruvates? Two. So I'm going to mark that off as two pyruvates. And as we transport my two pyruvates, one of them gets transported in, a little CO2 is made. Oh, look at this. NADH is going to be produced. We're going to attach on that coenzyme A to form acetyl CoA. So after pyruvate transport, I'm moving two pyruvates in. How many NADH do I have? Two. So two NADHs are going to be made. And I'm also going to have two acetyl coates. So two acetyl CoA molecules. Those two acetyl CoA molecules are in the mitochondrial matrix. Within the mitochondrial matrix, I have our cryptosome. Okay? Those two acetyl CoA, one of them combines with oxaloacetate to form citrate and it goes through the Krebs cycle. The second one combines with oxaloacetate to form citrate and also goes through the glycolytic or the uh, Krebs cycle. Okay? So, how many times am I going to go around the Krebs cycle? Twice. Twice. So I get one cycle per pyruvate or two cycles per glucose that enters into the, gly enters into the glycolytic pathway. Now, as you go through here, you can see NADHs that are being produced. I have this kind of weird step be between succinyl CoA and succinate, um, where I'm generating this molecule called GTP right here. GTP is not ATP, but we can use the energy of GTP for another enzymatic pathway not shown to generate these. So in your mind, you can kind of think, okay, we got some ATP that's being produced. How many ATP am I going to be producing from a molecule of pyruvate? From a molecule of pyruvate. One. From a molecule of glucose. Two. Okay? What kind of phosphorylation? It's happening at the level of the substrate. Substrate level phosphorylation. Okay? So I'm just going to simply call that two ATPs are produced. Okay. 
and it's going to be one ATP per higher bit. So if we go back over here to our accounting, we had a loss of two, then we gained four, which gave us a net of two. So from our net of two, we now add in two more, and so now I have a net of four ATPs after I've turned the Krebs cycle two times. Now I also have NADHs that are being produced, and I'm also going to have an FADH that's being generated. I get six NADHs produced because I have one, two, three that are already being generated from one pyruvate, so six total for my two pyruvates. Then I have my two FADAs that are being produced, one per pyruvate. And we have to think about both of these as just simply being electrons. And where are those electrons going to go to? Electron transportation. So we move into the electron transport. I already have four ATPs that have been generated. Now I have a bunch of NADHs and a, bu a bunch of FADH2s. Those are going to carry their electrons over here to the electron transport chain. Now if we kind of go back through the accounting here, we'll see starting from glycolysis, as we go through, I have two that are going to be produced here during the payoff phase of glycolysis, two more that are produced during pyruvate transport, and six that are produced in the Krebs cycle. That's a total of how many NADHs? Ten NADHs. So in the electron transport chain, I'm going to have a total of ten NADH that are available. Now, what you need to know is that there are a bunch of different things that can change NADH efficiency. And when I say NADH efficiency, I mean how well the NADH can release its electrons to generate the proton motive force to generate ATP molecules. Changes in temperature is one of those things. If you have a bunch of chemical reactions going on, it's going to increase temperature just a little bit, and this can actually cause efficiency to go down. And so you'll get numbers anywhere from two and a half to three ATP per NADH. And that two and a half to three is dependent upon the condition of the organism during production. What I'm going to have you, uh, what I'm going to require of you for this class is to just say that each NADH will yield about two and a half ATP. So from a single molecule of ATP uh, of NADH record, I drop off the electrons, they end up being pulled through the electron transport chain and end here with oxygen and hydrogen to form water. The amount of energy that's transferred as that electron is moved through complexes 1, 3, and 4 of the electron transport chain is enough energy to move hydrogens through protons into the inner membrane space to turn the uh, ATP synthase two and a half times. Each time it turns, it generates one molecule of ATP. So I get about enough energy for it to turn two and a half times. So two and a half doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, because how do you produce half a molecule of ATP? Another way to look at it is that for every two NADHs, I get about five total ATP. And then it gives me a nice raw energy. Okay? FADH. 
FADH enters here at complex two. Complex two doesn't move any protons into the inner membrane space. Only complexes one, three, and four. So FADH actually skips complex one. So we don't get as many hydrogen pumped through if the electrons come off of FADH. Okay? So for FADH, what we're going to say is from the two FADHs that I have available, each FADH2 is going to give me about 1.5 ATP. Okay, so a little less ATP because of where the NADH comes in. Uh, I, I'm sorry, because of where the FADH comes in to get the electron transport. Okay? Uh, so two FADH is how many ATPs? And three. This whole process here, using electrons through the electron transport chain ending with oxygen and hydrogen to generate water to create the proton motive force that turns the ATP synthase is not going to be substrate level ATP uh, or uh, substrate level phosphorylation. It's going to be oxidative phosphorylation. So the majority of ATP that are generated in a cell are coming from this oxidative phosphorylation process. So if you kind of do the math here, and account for everything that we got going on. My total ATP is going to go like this. Okay, so I'm going to give you a big long equation to summarize it. So my total ATP, we start out by losing two ATP. I'm going to say that that's a minus ATP, and it happens in glycolysis during the investment phase. So the G is glycolysis, the I and D is the investment phase, steps one through five. Then we get four ATP during glycolysis payoff. Okay, so minus two plus four. I get two more from substrate level phosphorylation from the crest. And then I get a total of 25 ATP if the electrons come from NADH. And I get three more if the electrons come from FADH2 in the the DH2 in the uh, electron transport chain. Now this whole equation here can actually be altered somewhat. So I'm going to work from this equation to give you some additional 25. 25. I had 10 NADHs available. Each is worth two and a half. 10 times two and a half gives me the 25. I had two FADHs. Each is worth 1.5. That gives me the three NADHs. So if you go through and, and do the math here, 25 into 3 is 28, plus 2 more is 30, plus 4 more is 34, minus my 2 gives me a max of 32 ATP. Now, I'm going to give you two different numbers here, two, two ranges of numbers. 30 to 32. And then 36 to 38. Yes, 36 to 38. Okay. These are numbers of ATPs that could potentially show up. And I'm going to tell you why we did these different numbers. 
first of all, we already know how we can get that number, right? We already know how we can get 32. How can we get 38? Well, because, again, depending on temperature and condition of the organism, NADH and FADH can account for 2.5 to 3 ATP, and from 1.5 to 2 ATP for FADH. So if instead of this being 2.5 here and 1.5 here, if this was actually 3 and 2, then I would end up with plus 30 ATP from NADH if, it come, if we account for 3, and I would end up with 4, a plus 4 from FADH if we account for 2. Okay? Then if you go through and do the math, that's 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40 minus my 2 will give me my 38. So the difference between the 32 and the 38 is just simply the 2.5 and, and the 1.5 versus 3 and 2. So really, what I'm saying is because there's a range of 2.5 to 3 ATP per NADH and a range of 1.5 and and to 2, you can get two separate sets of numbers. I'm really comfortable if you just say it's 30 to 32 ATP because we assume a 2.5 and a 1.5 and and for NADH and NADH. Okay? But how about the lower number here, 30 and 36? Well, remember that we have a couple FADHs, uh, I'm sorry, a couple NADHs, rather, that are going to be produced out in the cytosol. But where are they utilized? Where do they go through the electron transport chain? In the mitochondria, which means the NADHs that are produced during glycolysis have to be transported into the matrix. So let's talk about some of the variation here. So for those NADHs that are produced in the cytosol, the electrons have to be transported to the electron transport chain, which is in the mitochondria. We are not transporting the NADH itself. We're just transitioning the electrons from the cytosol into the mitochondrial matrix. So the NADH that's produced during the glycolytic pathway carries the electron to the mitochondria and passes it off to a transfer protein. And it gets reassociated with an uh, uh, electron shuttle in the mitochondrial matrix. So in other words, if this is cytosol out here and this is the matrix in here, my NADH with its electron, takes the electron to a transport protein, and the electron actually goes through, and on the other side, I have NADH plus, or NAD plus, that picks up that electron to generate NADH. Or, and this is where the variation comes in, I could actually have a protein that takes that electron, and rather than sending it on to NADH, it goes from FAD, to FADH2. Now, what happens if the NADH ends up here with FADH2? Instead of having 10 total NADHs to get my 25, I may actually reduce that by 2, so I have 8 NADHs. So if I have 8 NADHs here at 2.5, that's going to yield a total of 20, not 25, if I'm doing my math right, 25 ATPs. Whereas the FADHs, if both the electrons from the NADHs produced out here get converted to FADHs, I now have um, not two FADHs, but four FADHs, and so it's four times one and a half which gives me six total ATPs. If this is four FADHs. 
NADH2s to generate 6. Now when you go through to do the math, you have 6 plus 20, which is 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, minus my 2 will give me my 30. Does everybody see the math there? So the variation comes in because of those two transport proteins. One will deposit electrons into NADH, one will deposit electrons into FADH from those NADHs that are off the sites. That would apply the same here um, with the 36. Again, this is basically the difference between applying 2.5 for NADH and 1.5 for FADH2 versus 3 and 2 to get all of these numbers. The same variation still in the NADH is being passed across to those transport molecules into the elect to get the electron from NADH of the cytosol into the um, mitochondrial matrix. The same math is still applying. Is everybody following what I'm saying? So those electrons are either going to be exchanged to NADH or FADH2, depending on the transport, the electron transport protein that the cytosolic NADH interacts with. So you could also get 31, right? Because you can get one set of electrons that get dumped off to NADH and another set of electrons that get dumped off to the FADH2. So you end up with nine NADHs and three of the ages, and that would end up being 31 total electrons. Wow, I'm sorry, 18 minutes. So again, if that FADH2 exchanger is the one that's used, then in the Electron transport chain will only have eight NADHs that are available rather than 10, and four FADHs, FADH2s that are available instead of the two. And then again, that changes the mass, so that we end up with a mass of 30. And then if you apply the three and the two for accounting for the needs to be from any deviation of the DH2, that would change it to 36. Is everybody clear as mud, right? You sort of feel like that you, you got an idea of what's going on here. What kind of questions do you have? So again, you got to be doing battle with this. How many steps in glycolysis? Ten. How many ATPs are produced? How no, many in glycolysis? How many ATPs produce in glycolysis? It's a net of two, it's a total of four. So I got a total of four that are produced, but I really only get two because I put two in during steps one through five. And those were steps one to three. Okay. And I mean, produce four, but the net value is two. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of like um, I give you $100, and you go and you investor, you use it to make more money, and you come back and you give me $150. So you've given me $150, but how much did I really make? I really made 50 because you're paying back 100 and you're giving me the, the 50 that you made. Okay? So two get invested, which is a minus two, net of minus two. Four get produced, which is a plus four. Minus two to the plus four becomes a net of plus two ATP made during glycolysis. Crunch cycle, how many steps? Eight total steps in, in the Krebs cycle. How many NADHs are produced per molecule of pyrimidine? 
here. Three. Up here four, up here two, and it's three. Yeah. So three total NADHs. How about if we look for a molecule of glucose? How many NADHs do we have? So from a molecule of glucose, how many times can I turn the Krebs cycle? Two times. If I'm producing three NADHs per cycle, total of six NADHs. How many NADHs? One per cycle, two total from the molecule of glucose. How many NADHs do I get for pyruvate transport? Two. One per pyruvate. I get the two pyruvates at the end of the glycolytic pathway. Both of them get transported here. Each one produces one NADH, so I get a total of two NADHs. Through the Krebs cycle, I also generate two ATPs. One per cycle. One per pyruvate, two per glucose. What is that called again? When I produce ATP I, in either the glycolytic pathway or the Krebs cycle. It's at the level of the substrate. <laughs> so it's at the level of the substrate, so the substrate level phosphorylation. If I take the net of two from glycolysis, add in the two more from the Krebs cycle, I got a total of four ATP that are produced throughout the first two steps of cellular respiration, then you go into the electron transport chain. And what are we using in the electron transport chain? We're using those electron shuttles that are called NADH and FADH2. Those carry electrons. Think of NADH and FADH. as being school buses that carry half the electrons to the electron transport chain. And they drop those electron transport chains off. If it's NADH at complex 1 of the electron transport chain, if it's FADH2 at complex 2 of the, FA, of the electron transport chain. Dropping them off at those two different locations means two different electronegativities. And so the electrons get pulled through the pathway differently. Complex 1, 3, and 4 spit hydrogens or protons into the inner membrane space. And then we use that to cycle ATP synthase to generate our ATP molecules. If I gave you a quiz on Friday, would you be ready? I'm going to the rest of the have, have a nice, uh, a nice Monday thinking about that. What?